Okay, good afternoon. As David said, I'll be discussing a high resolution subsurface imaging project at the Pataga Point site. And uh, Pataga Point is already on the National Register. Um, it's been the subject of extensive past uh, uh, archaeological research. And this investigation was conducted in support of uh, the Cathio Archaeology Day field program run by David Mather and Jim Cummings of the Minnesota DNR, in which they are uh, excavating one square meter of the site uh, every year, starting in 2006 up through the, the present. Uh, for those of you not familiar, the Pataga Point site is a large multi-component site uh, located on the south shore of uh, Lake Mille Lacs uh, at the Rum River outlet on what is known as Lake Ogeechee. Um, the site is quite large. It encompasses uh, most of this point here, but uh, our particular area of interest is much smaller, uh, shown right here. And here is our area of interest shown in an aerial photo. As you can see, it's located uh, just to the east of the artificial swimming hole at the, at the park. And the uh, interpretive center of, at Pataga Point is located just off our, our photo there to the north of the parking lot. So our specific area of interest is measures 30 by 35 meters. Um, the site datum is shown, shown there. And the Cathio Archaeology Day uh, excavation units are just to the south of, of that datum point. Uh, just a quick LIDAR image of the point. Um, mostly what we're seeing here are the tops of trees. Um, data sample density wasn't quite good enough to, to get a good uh, bare earth image of, of the site. And here again is our geophysical survey grid uh, located in that grove of trees right there. Here is a, a detail of our geophysical survey grid. Each of the, of the uh, little round uh, dots are uh, the base of a tree. It was pretty heavily forested. We had a uh, ATV trail that went north-south across, across the grid. Um, this was an old park maintenance trail that uh, has since been uh, moved elsewhere. An east-west field boundary road. Um, the site used to be a, a farm back in the 30s before it was it became part of the state park system. And this shows uh, where the Archaeology Day excavation units are located in, in relation to the geophysical survey grid. Uh, as many people also know, uh, the site was previously excavated back in the 60s in the 66-67 field season by Eldon Johnson and Peter Bleed um, and, and students from the University of Minnesota. And the Cathio Archaeology Day field program has encountered evidence of these past excavations. You see here um, uh, the remains of an old excavation block uh, showing up in the uh, plan view of this particular unit. And here is a plan map showing uh, uh, results from 2006 through 2010. Um, and this, this was as, as it was just prior to the uh, geophysical survey. Again, this is the old excavation bock, and this bock contained evidence, uh, intact evidence of a burned house feature um, that was at least partially excavated back in the 60s. And here is a slide showing uh, evidence of this burn feature. Note the uh, oxidized soil here and uh, heavy charcoal layer here. Uh, one, one feature was fully excavated back in the 60s, and we s suspect that this is possibly in our geophysical survey grid. And there's also vague mention of two additional smaller blocks that also contained houses, but uh, um, they were only partially excavated, and we don't really have any documentation other than uh, a brief mention in some site notes. So what are our project objectives? Uh, first, we hope to locate and map the 1960s excavation blocks. Uh, second, map the extent of this burned house, if anything remained of it. We, we weren't exactly sure about that. 
and uh, finally to locate and map any previously unknown archaeological features within our relatively small survey grid. Uh, three different geophysical survey methods uh, were used during the investigation. Uh, we see here the ground penetrating sur uh, radar survey in action. Um, and here is the magnetic field gradient survey in action. And we also did electrical resistance survey. Um, note the, uh, the outlines of the archaeology day excavation units are lined in wood here, which is kind of neat and made them easy to, to relocate. So why, why do three different survey methods? Well, each method responds to contrasts in different soil material properties, uh, electrical resistivity, uh, the dielectric constant for GPR survey, and magnetic susceptibility for the magnetic survey. Uh, so we hope that at least one of the, uh, the archaeology would have a contrast between the archaeology and the surrounding soil with, in at least one of these uh, material properties. And at the beginning, I said it was a high resolution survey. And what I really mean by that is it's a date, high data sample density survey. Uh, we collected data in linear transects spaced 50 centimeters apart uh, over the entire grid. This resulted in four samples per square meter for the electrical resistance, 16 samples per square meter in magnetics. And in the case of the radar survey, we also surveyed orthogonal to that, so back the other direction at the same sample density. And this results in 80 GPR traces per square meter, so quite high. And each GPR trace uh, contains 200 points in the time or the depth domain. So our actual da GPR data sample density is 16,000 points per square meter, so extremely high. And we'll look at uh, the GPR data in, as a series of plan view images. Um, and each of these images represents the average reflected signal amplitude within a relatively small uh, time or depth window, in, in our case, about five centimeters. So this, this graphic here kind of introduces the concept of a GPR data volume. Um, each of the images it's cycling through is an average amplitude within a five centimeter thick uh, uh, zone. And so what we look for is patterning in that signal response. And in this next slide, we'll take a, a much more detailed look at the GPR data. Oh, I think we're having a, a slight technical difficulty here, but I, I can resolve this quick, I believe. Okay. Okay, so what I'm going to do is uh, click this button, and we're going to cycle through uh, almost 100 GPR images starting at the ground surface down to approximately one, one meter below surface. So it's, it's going to play as an animated sequence and then stop. So let me just play it one time and get a look at it. And note the, uh, the depths of each image are given uh, below the imagery. So now I'll overlay our uh, excavation units for the archaeology day uh, excavation units here and play it again just so you can, can see how the signal response relates to the location of the units. Um, and it goes pretty fast. I'll play it one more time after this and stop it at an opportune moment. So this strong response here, I believe, uh, is related to the archaeology at the site, and uh, we'll get into more detail in that in a little bit. But first, I'll uh, present the uh, magnetic survey results uh, as an overlay, uh, both as a low contrast and a high contrast image, and also the electrical resistance data. And note there are a bunch of uh, voids in this image. All these green green boxes are where we couldn't collect data because uh, there was a tree there, so it turned out to be a, a nice map of, of the trees on the site. 
Okay, one more quick look at the GPR survey data before uh, we get into interpretations. Um, this is as a 3D data volume that's partially transparent. Uh, so note, it's relatively transparent up near the surface, uh, and then there's a strong signal response from the glacial till at the site. And this is the archaeology, uh, fairly high in the profile. Okay, so on to interpretations. Um, as I said, uh, here are the uh, archaeology day uh, excavation units and this strong response in the vicinity of the excavation units. I believe our reflections off of the, the burn layer that uh, David and Jim have uh, documented. So that's the uh, primary archaeological signal. I think there are two intrusive features shown here and here. They're a little bit shallower, and they, they might be associated with this burn layer, uh, or might not. It might be something you know more recent and intrusive. I'm not sure about that, but hopefully testing will determine it. And the southernmost of these has a strong correlation in the electrical resistance data shown here. I'm toggling back and forth between GPR and electrical resistance. So when you have a, a correlation between, across methods, that's usually uh, indicative of uh, a good solid feature. Uh, there are several long linear uh, anomalies in the GPR data. Um, we're quite certain that this two track that we see here is caused by compacted soil from this ATV uh, maintenance trail. Uh, the east-west linear trending anomaly uh, is likely the edge of an old field boundary road and shown in yellow um, are a bunch of or several long linear features of unknown origin but we do know that compacted soil from the ATV trail is causing a signal response so we're speculating that uh, these unknown long linear things also might be caused by compacted soil, possibly foot trails uh, leading to and from features on the site associated with the occupation of the site. Could also be foot trails from the 1960s archeologists uh, walking to and from their excavation block. Uh, magnetic survey results here. Uh, there are several really strong, bright uh, dipoles uh, magnetic signal with both a strong positive and negative component. This is typical of uh, modern iron uh, near the surface. It's probably uh, artifacts associated with archaeologists, uh, you know, gutter spikes, pin flags, that sort of thing. Uh, shown in red here are several additional dipoles that are a little more diffuse, not quite as strong. This is usually indicative of uh, greater depth below surface. Could be iron artifacts, could be modern iron debris buried a bit deeper. Could also be strongly magnetized glacial cobbles, uh, which is a recurring problem in Minnesota magnetic surveys where, there are, where there's shallow uh, glacial till, which is a good part of the state. Uh, there's a couple really strong, distinct lightning strikes, or responses from lightning strikes in the data. This is known as lightning-induced remnant magnetization. It's where the lightning current uh, travels through the soil and strongly magnetizes all the soil in the vicinity and, and rocks or whatever happens to be down there. And it's a little difficult to see that orange, but uh, a couple couple uh, signal responses there I suspect are fire altered features, possibly archaeology. They could also be lightning strikes that have been bioturbated, possibly older strikes, and that tends to degrade the s signal strength. So to, to summarize things, um, I believe this strong dark response in the vicinity of the excavation units are, is, re represents reflections coming off the, the burn layer uh, uh, from the house. But note, right around the actual excavation uh, units, there's a lack of response. And what I think that lack of response represents is uh, the location of one of the undocumented excavation blocks from back in the 60s. And in the, this next slide, we'll look at how, how this undocumented block looks in the uh, magnetic data. And note that there's kind of a rectilinear area of uh, lighter coloration. This means it's negative magnetic signal. 
and the cause of that would be uh, a lack of an in-situ uh, magnetically enhanced A-horizon uh, material in the, in the backfilled excavation areas. And finally, uh, here's one possible location of uh, the 1960s house. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty associated with the location, but it, but it is it kind of uh, interesting to, to imagine that uh, the foot trails might lead uh, directly into the uh, entrance of the house. So I'd just like to emphasize that these in initial interpretations should be viewed as hypotheses, and the next thing that needs to take place is some testing. Um, one possible test location would be right in the center of the suspected burned zone and test what is this response really caused by a, a burned horizon or check if there, there's any evidence of 1960s excavation going on there. Uh, here's a possible test location uh, in relation to the magnetic data and this test location would, would determine whether this uh, linear or rectilinear feature is indeed, does indeed represent the uh, boundaries of a old excavation block. So to wrap it up, uh, testing uh, will determine whether we should accept or reject our initial interpretations um, and the test data can be used to revise and elaborate our interpretations and the whole process is uh, maybe considered a iterative feedback loop that uh, allows us to interpret the data with a lot more accuracy. Okay, thank you very much.